Hi everyone, thank you for joining me today. Um, so I'll basically, I'll just go through the presentation, I'll go through a couple agenda items, and I just wanted to acknowledge that uh, some folks prefer to um, speak directly to, to any of us, so I'll have my contact information there, or maybe there's a question that comes up for you after the session when you've had some time to digest the information. So I'll make sure to leave you with some contact information on the last slide. Uh, today's session is called Using Hui Hua's Research Guides, What They Are and How We Use Them. Okay, we can move to the next slide. So for the agenda today, I will briefly go through the through an introduction. I will talk about what research guides are. Uh, we'll specifically talk about Hui Hua's research guides, uh, how you can use them. We'll go through some example guides and I'm going to leave some time for question and answers in case anybody would like to, in case anybody has any pressing questions. Next slide. So now that we're all in a virtual environment, um, I wanted to acknowledge that Hui Hua Library, or sorry, I wanted to introduce, sorry, I jumped ahead a little bit there, Carissa. Here we go. <laughs> there we go. So Hui Hua Library, sorry, is uh, part of the First Nations House of Learning. So we're an Aboriginal branch of an academic library and we're unique uh, we have a unique Aboriginal classification system and subject heading. So these are some of the, uh, the things that we're most well known for. My name is Carlene Delorier Lyle. I'm the information services librarian at Hui Hua Library. I started there as a student and have graduated and now a full-time librarian. I'm Ojibwe, Cree, and mixed settler ancestry. Uh, my families are from Barrens River, Manitoba, but I was born and raised in the Okanagan. Next slide. So before we get started, I just wanted to acknowledge that although I'm in a virtual place right now, and we're all kind of coming from different areas that Hui Hua Library and the UBC campus or the Vancouver campus is on the unceded territory of the Musqueam people. I'm currently coming at you live from East Vancouver or uh, the shared territory of MST, so Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. Um, especially when we're talking about research guides, this is absolutely something that we consider not only who we are as we build the research guides, but we definitely think about what the impact is um, when we're creating and distributing this in a public facing, in a public facing way. Um, so we definitely start with the local community and uh, what we think would be relevant to loop in or uh, perhaps information that we might want to exclude or just things to consider. It's, it's a place that we revisit through this work. So we're ready to get into what research guides are. According to UBC library, research guides are essentially web pages created at UBC by librarians, student librarians, um, other student employees using a SpringShare LibGuide platform. So I can also share this uh, slide deck with you folks in case you would like to have any of the links. Uh, they're essentially meant to support research by sharing important information and resources for courses, subject areas on a research topic. Uh, they are definitely a starting point for students and researchers on specific topics or tutorials. Um, they are important extensions of librarians' reference and information services since they're accessible at all times. So even if you can't get a hold of us, uh, they're, they're a place to at least start some of the research until you can hear back from one of us. And um, they can act as an entry point for further contact with subject librarians. So usually you'll see some sort of contact information. Um, people will usually put a little picture of themselves, just letting you know who your subject librarian is and who you would contact if you needed some further assistance on a given area. Next slide. So essentially, essentially, they are online resources and research guides are literally just meant to help guide your research. From what I've seen um, in my own personal work, they are organized around or they are, are specific to a subject area. They might be on a specific uh, tutorial, tutorial or skill that a librarian would like you to learn. Um, they are also specific to a course at times. 
And at Huihua, we, uh, we create ours based off of a topic or a subject area, and they are used to find reliable authoritative information on a topic or a subject area. One of the most important pieces of our research guides is around terminology, but also in search strategies, because it's not always easy to find indigenous uh, related or indigenous topics um, when we're looking at historical name changes and things like that over time. So I'd say those are definitely some of the key components of our research guides. So what you're looking at here is on the right hand side, this is what our Huihua Research Guides portal looks like. You can find this by visiting our website um, and then you scroll down to the bottom and you'll see a Research Guides portal. I can go through this afterwards if this would be helpful for folks as well. What you're looking at are 20 published Huihua Guides. And then at the bottom, we've also included 11 relevant UBC guides. So the ones that you see that have the First Nations House of Learning logo are ones that we have published ourselves, either student librarians or librarians. Um, and then the ones that are at the bottom are based off of topics that we either frequently get asked at the public services side or else that we think people would go looking for based off of what, we ex what we've experienced at the public services side. Um, they're created by topic occasionally for a course or a program. They typically follow a basic structure. And from my time at Huihua, I've noticed that we build them based off of a trend or a pattern and a gap. So I'll talk a little bit more about what that means to me later on. Next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. <laughs> so created by a topic or occasionally a course or program. What we're seeing here is the, on the left-hand side, we have our Aboriginal Languages Research Guide. Um, I pulled this one as an example because uh, Aboriginal languages are a, a topic that we are frequently asked about at the, at the reference desk. And that's more than likely because in BC, there's such a diversity in Indigenous languages. There's also a lot of these languages that are uh, endangered. UBC has the First Nations and Endangered Languages course that we support, and we're uh, close with some of the faculty in there. We are frequently asked both by patrons at UBC as well as community, community users about Indigenous languages in general. And so it made sense that we would want to create a research guide around this to help support some of these FAQ um, and to help kind of delve into some of the uh, broad scope questions that we'll get asked since we have such a, a broad patron base that comes to us. On the right hand side, what you're seeing is, as opposed to a topic, on the right hand side, what you're seeing is a research guide that was created for a specific program. So the NITEP program, for anybody in the room that doesn't know, uh, these are our Indigenous teacher candidates. And we created this guide for them because um, the Longhouse, the library, and NITEP, uh, we share a very special origin. We were built and created alongside one another. Our collection has origin uh, with the NITEP program. Uh, we definitely are interested in supporting our young indigenous uh, educators as they transform not only the university, but educational practices as they leave, as they leave campus. Um, and because NITEP has uh, several field centers that are run in, in uh, for several years in one area and, and then they move around quite often. And because these locations are, um, they're not typically that close to campus or some of them might not be close to campus, we acknowledge the fact that they have a, a different resource access based off of their needs. So perhaps that could be like a, a greater loan period or um, different delivery options and things like that. And so in order for the UBC library systems to recognize that they're NITEPers, uh, there's different protocols that, that come with that. So there's specific information that we've put forward so that it's helpful for folks as they're at their field centers to uh, learn how to create, create accounts for themselves and kind of go through all of those. So um, 
here we're kind of seeing two different examples based off of what we figured uh, were gaps or needs uh, for our patron base. So in general, they follow a basic structure. On the right hand side, what you're seeing is a picture of the tabs for our research guide on Indigenous new media. For the most part, they have a home tab. This will explain some of the basics, just introductory level about what the topic is. Usually this is just foundational information that we assume uh, somebody who is perhaps new to the topic uh, might, might be interested to know and to get them started. In the books and media tab, it's books and media. Media could be uh, our DVDs or streaming media sites if we have any in our particular area that are of interest for folks. And this is a space that I like to direct people to around terminology because we will develop keyword searches and changes over time around perhaps even like linguistic groups or um, thinking about historical terms that we wouldn't use in everyday language. The books and media tab is where you're gonna find a lot of that really helpful information. And even when we've ended a session with a class, this is a great touchstone for students to return to, or students and researchers to return to in case they need a refresher on anything that we talked about. The articles and databases have the articles and databases. Um, we've also gone through and tried to highlight any that we think are particularly relevant to a topic thesis and dissertations, and then citing. So those are kind of the ones that you typically see. But I did want to add a note here that we do add additional tabs for certain topics. Um, if we feel that it it's, um, if there's enough conversation or resources that would warrant it to be its own tab, um, this could be just, you know, for example, uh, what we're looking at here would be graphic novels and comic books zines, memes, podcasts, we figured that these would be some of the main areas that folks would be interested in on this topic. And it was enough and it was enough information that we figured we should um, make give it its own tab, right? Next slide. So as I'd mentioned before, from my experience and from my personal understanding of how we build research guides, it's typically been off of a trend or a pattern and a gap. So at the front desk or when at the front desk or public services, when people ask questions, uh, we've noticed that we're being asked the same question frequently. Um, an example of this might be that within a two day span or even within a week, if I've had several students come to me asking about the potlatch, it's usually a pretty good indicator to me that either the professor has just assigned this related topic or that the assignment's gonna be, or that the assignment's almost due. This is typically when I have a lot of students coming in to ask these questions. Um, since I have so many people asking the same question, that to me is the gap. It's the knowledge gap. So another example of this would be that within the last five years, there's been an increase in people asking about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. More specifically, people are asking about the calls to action. But patrons are asking about the TRC and from various backgrounds, right? So on the one hand, I see the, um, the questions being asked again, enough to become a trend or a pattern, but the things that are very different about them are the fact that they're coming from various uh, disciplines, subject areas, perspectives, and lived experiences. Next slide. So the trickiest part of building a research guide is that people are asking similar questions and coming from diverse backgrounds. Um, by this diversity, I'm thinking in terms of um, how I view them as a patron. So uh, we usually will organize them or we'll kind of track and organize our understanding between students, faculty, community users, it could be a graduate student, um, and the reason why that's important for us to assess is because the needs based off of, off of uh, people's level of education will be different. Um, somebody who's studying their, in their PhD 
uh, will require different resources or a different level of resources and help than someone who's just fresh out of high school coming to the university and they're just in their undergrad now. Um, one of the other differences is that they are coming from different areas of study. They also have different ways of relating to a topic. They have broad uses for the, or their intentions for the information are, are very, very broad. Um, an example of this for me would be a, a student who's in the endangered languages class at UBC, who belongs to a community that has few language speakers is going to relate to their course content work differently than a non-Indigenous student taking the same course as an elective. Someone who's studying as an educator with personal ties to residential school experiences, perhaps this is even familial, will relate to the course content and educational system differently than someone who does not share the same ties to this history. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that people relate to the content differently and we have various intentions for our work. Our research guides seek to capture and reflect those perspectives while also distributing information that we trust. Next slide. Okay, so this brings me to Hui Hua's patrons. Um, the way that I tried to, when I was building the slide and kind of trying to figure out how I was gonna conceptualize this idea, I was reminded of a story from when I was a student at the Okanagan campus. And I was debating over whether I wanted to become a librarian and I was trying to figure out different streams of librarianship. And when I'd asked my supervisor at the time to tell me about how they understood the differences between academic and public libraries, they offered up um, an example of when you're at an academic library, you may have someone that comes to you and they are asking for information on what resources are available to a single parent in a very specific geographic area. And because we're in education setting and a, a post-secondary uh, education, we can make assumptions about the fact that this is more than likely for a class project. Um, they're gonna be looking for statistics. Um, what course are they in? How can we tie this in so that it's relevant? And then they said to me, when I'm working in a public library, one of the difference or one of the main differences is that I'm being asked a similar question, but I'm not speaking to a student. I'm speaking to that parent that needs those resources. And so you're essentially being asked a very similar question, but the needs are really different. And that's definitely something that we have to take into consideration when we create our, our research guides at Huihua. Because when I first started spending time at the reference desk, one of the things that I noticed was that we are holding all of these academic asks and we have responsibilities uh, to our UBC community. But because of our specialization and because people feel comfortable to come to us for, for reference questions, we also carry that as well. We have a lot of people that are coming from non-academic um, non -academic perspectives for very similar information. So this is how I tried to break it up, was we have the UBC, UBC and academic side, which is largely our students, our staff, faculty, researchers, or visiting scholars. And then we have people that would be considered, I guess, more of a public library sphere. Uh, we've got people that are living on campus and they come from all stages of life. We've got children, seniors, you name it. We've got local and global indigenous communities. So we have folks that come to us from local communities, um, MST. We also have folks that ask us questions from Australia and New Zealand. There are folks that uh, are off campus community as well that um, have some folks will come all the way from the mission to come to come visit as well. We frequently have tourists that come from MOA um, or largely from MOA just because if people come to the campus and they're at MOA then they typically like to see what research and resources we have as well. And then we have associations, corporations, societies and more like this is this is really just the tip of the iceberg of, of how many what the diversity is in in our patron base. 
So this really begs the question, which brings me to my next slide, is how do folks use them? Next slide, please. <laughs> And yeah, I'm just going to jump to this one. So how do I use them? Um, in their most basic function, they are great places to start so that people can find recommendations on books, databases, organizations, associations. Uh, there's relevant information on any given area of research. The other really nice function about research guides is they, they have a search function, search function, so you can actually search within them. Uh, but more complex than that is that it really depends on someone's purpose. And I know that that's vague, but I'm hoping to both complicate and kind of uh, get us thinking about getting some thoughts percolating around why it's complex. Next slide, please. So when I was thinking about this question of how do I use them, um, I really felt that it depended on who somebody is. So there was a couple examples that I pulled out here. Uh, we have an Indigenous student, a community member, a faculty, or a researcher. Um, let's just say that they come in with the question, I'm interested in social movements related to resource extraction. Now, this most likely is not the way that they actually word their question, but essentially this is what this person might be looking for, right? Um, if this is an Indigenous a student, maybe they're at UBC, uh, I can make a lot of assumptions about what type of resources I should be putting forward for them, assuming that this is something that they're going to be putting into their research. Um, but some of the things that I might not see is that, uh, is this something that they're directly impacted by? So is there other things happening off campus around uh, resource extraction? Is it in their community? And how does that impact them? And if I have a relationship with this student, I might be able to tease out some of those details. And so it becomes less about just the research aspect. Um, maybe they need, if they're a newcomer to UBC, uh, they might be interested in resources for wellness or knowing that, uh, how do they find uh, other indigenous students around? Do they know about collegium? Things like that, right? If they're a community member, one of the things that I might not know is that they could be interested in some sort of policy change around this. It really depends on how much information um, I can kind of pull out through a conversation with a patron or that people are really willing to give, which is totally up to them. If they're a faculty member, they could be looking for course resources. Uh, if they're a researcher, they could be, we sometimes have folks that are researchers that actually work at some of these uh, companies that that um, that focus on resource extraction and it's a little bit harder to pull out some of those details so again it really really depends on um, how people are going to use them it depends on what their intent is with the information or who they are and kind of what they're bringing bringing with them throughout uh, throughout their question Next slide, please. So now I wanted to delve into a few examples of our research guides. What we're seeing right now is Huihua's Indigenous Land-Based Activism Guide. So this guide, uh, it was, it originated, it originally was called a Grassroots and Social Movements Research Guide. And I started working on this when I was still a student. So this would have been a number of years ago. My supervisor and I decided um, when it became time to publish the, the research guide, we decided that we actually wanted to leave it unpublished just based off of uh, what had been happening off campus. That seemed like a, a decision that we needed to make for the time. But then we decided to turn it into a course specific guide. So one of the things that we'd kept in mind is that we understood it was a valuable resource because so many people were asking about land sovereignty, social movements, uh, decolonial grassroots movements, social justice, questions surrounding these concepts. And what we found was that there was actually another need. There was um, a professor who was looking at the way that social movements and activism and land defenders are, um, 
are uh, depicted in literature. So part of their coursework was going to be looking at various types of literature around uh, environment and resource extraction, um, some of the demonstrations alongside all of that and kind of really unpacking and looking at how people are being described in some of the literature there. So what we did was we turned the grassroots research guide into um, an English course, course guide and we embedded it in that way. And this gave us a space where it was helpful for the class, but it also gave us a public facing document and resource that we could redirect other patrons who are not in this class necessarily, but we knew could also use some of the information there. So if I flash forward a little bit, then um, I've graduated and I have moved into a position as a full-time librarian. And I have the pleasure of working with Bronte Burnett, who is also in the room with us today. And during our time together, they were a student librarian. And one of their tasks was to look at how to refresh and revitalize this guide in particular. So we updated some of the information. We took out the course specific uh, content. We made it a bit more, um, we, we broadened it so that it was something that wasn't again, tied specifically to the course, but that we figured multiple people could use. Since then there had been, um, like this decision was made because there were, there was so much conflict happening in Wet'suwet'en and because we knew that we had folks in our, in our longhouse community that were being, um, that were being impacted by this issue. And so it was really important to us to try and figure out how we were going to revitalize this, this guide in a way that could be supportive in that way. So again, um, this was something that we put a lot of time into. Um, again, as you go through, you can see that we've got our typical structure. There's the books and media gap, uh, tab, the articles and databases, theses and citing. But what we also have are tabs on terminology, um, news and social media allyship. So all of these things, uh, as we started to try and tease out other information that we figured would be useful for folks, again, it warranted enough to make its own tab. Okay, next slide, please. So the main point here, and I felt that I felt that I'd run into this question of what don't we share multiple times as I'd revisit this this one research guide in particular. Uh, as a student, this was something, and as an Indigenous student, this was something that I valued and I, I wanted created. Um, there was also issues around um, what do we share publicly and also an awareness around the fact that um, who, who our intended audiences may not, not always be whose hands these resources fall into. Um, so we were cognizant of that and this really got us thinking about the question of what don't we share? So on the news media ground level communication, you started to see, especially around what's Owen, is that people were using hashtags. People are using hashtags uh, on social media in order to um, regain and share control over the way that what's happening, the events that are happening are being um, broadcast and shared outside of, you know, directly what's happening in this space. So we understood when we revitalized this guide that that was a place that we knew people would go looking for information. And we were very particular about which hashtags we were going to use. We gave people information about what they were, how to use them, um, what that means on a social media platform. Um, and the other thing that we were really aware of though is that we too have social media platforms. Huihua has, Twitter and Facebook, and we utilize these as ways to communicate with people as well. So it was important to us that as we shared these research guides, on the one hand, it makes sense to be using them in order for findability to use a hashtag so that people can find the research guide. But at the same time, we understood that that communication path was very intentional for, for not necessarily academic research. And we respect the fact that those things are definitely intertwined and connected, but that this didn't necessarily have a space for it. So we were thinking about that as well. Next slide, please.
And then from there, shortly after the research guide got its little refresher and we felt like it was in a good place to put it into a public facing uh, space, which was our, our research guide portal and to distribute on social media, there was a, um, a teach-in on April 9th. And this was shortly after we all had to separate and work in our virtual environments. And they were able to push back the date for this teach-in and to keep the conversation going. So what we're looking at is just the first page of a two page document that again uh, was created with the help of CTLT, um, Vicki George from the Longhouse, as well as Bronte Burnett. And there was this conversation around, okay, if we're going to be having this teach in, then what resources can we put forward? Uh, luckily, this research guide had already been uh, published, and so it was going to be useful in that way. But at this, so again, how does how you use the research guide really depends on your intent. So in this situation, some of the resources that were pulled and put into this two-page uh, handout for folks who were participating in the teach-in were extracted from the research guide. Um, this two pager still lives and it's now housed uh, in, in, in the land based activism research guide as well. So that's the way that these can be informed, right? Or these, the way that the research guides can inform people's uh, research or, or talks or workshops or, or courses. Next slide, please. <laughs> And then for our second example, um, what we're looking at here is a broadcast for a conference that took place in June of 2019. So what they decided was that um, there was going to be a, a two day conference and it was going to be it was going to take place in the Longhouse. And they were going to be discussing uh, the epidemic of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls across both Canada and the United States, um, referring to the medicine line or the 49th parallel that uh, arbitrarily divides these two spaces. So during this event or getting leading up to this event, we anticipated that we would have quite a bit of foot traffic. So jumping our timelines a little bit ahead. This was before the pandemic happened when we were still able to meet one another. And typically when there's a lot of foot traffic at the Longhouse, we do end up getting quite a few visitors that come in just because they're in the area. There's a lot of visiting scholars and they may not have been around before or been to UBC before. But because of the nature of the top, of the topic and the talk and the conference, we figured that there would be quite a bit of conversation around, uh, you know, people wanting to access our resources because they're particularly relevant to, to what folks are gonna be speaking about over these last couple of days. So what we did, next slide, please. is we sent our student librarian, Bronte Burnett, to the conference to participate, to kind of keep an eye on any of the conversations happening, um, you know, to just try and figure out maybe what those bridges could be. And this was definitely an, an area that they were passionate about. So within, after the two day conference, they ended up creating the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls if you look really closely at the top right hand side, it says search this guide. That's where I was saying that these guides are also also searchable for anybody that was interested. And again, what we're seeing here is a homepage, a books and media tab. We have our articles and databases, right? So again, it's still, it's following this similar structure with the additional tabs uh, added. Next slide, please. And I also wanted to touch base on our Two-Spirit and Indigenous Queer Research Guide. This work was definitely spearheaded by our current librarian and almost graduating librarian, student librarian, Bronwyn Mackay. Um, 
we decided that we wanted to create this research guide because we were struck by conversations we'd had with a PhD student who was studying closely in this area of two-spirit and Indigenous queer identities. And from that conversation, and then we started to have them internally, um, I actually started to learn that some of our own staff had been in instructional sessions where they too had had difficulty finding uh, two-spirit characters in fiction. And so the overarching theme for us was actually closer around, um, I don't want to say the invisibility of, but uh, the we felt that there needed to be a, a surfacing or a, a way to teach people how to find two-spirit and Indigenous queer um, perspectives, voices, whether that be in academics or literature, poetry, film, in all of these areas, because we started to see that it was it wasn't as easy to find that, especially when it comes to things like archives and stuff. So we created this research guide. Um, at this point in the session, I'd actually like to turn on the annotation feature because I want to set this up a bit more like a uh, an activity here. So what we're looking at is on the left hand side, you have questions one, two and three. These are three questions that I have personally been asked. These are three different people who are coming from three different backgrounds with completely different questions. Some of them are using it for personal reasons because of their professional work or because of their personal work. And I have utilized the Two-Spirit and Indigenous Queer Research Guide for to answer all three of these questions. So if we, I'm sorry, I just wanted to clarify that we do have the annotation feature set. Yep, ready to go. Okay. So I'm going to ask folks to pick a question and to, to think about where, where on the research guide did, would they start or go looking for this information and to just put a little sticker or perhaps circle places and tabs that you would go looking for this information. Okay, I'm not seeing any other fun stickers showing up. So I think we're, we're good. So with this first question, yes, um, I'm looking for Two-Spirit and Indigenous queer resources for a child, as well as family resources on how to support the child. Typically, I would, I can see here that some folks have found our, our resource list and they've put a couple hearts. So that's a good, we did definitely put a lot of love into that. And so we wanted to make sure that that was at the forefront. And they've also checked off a books and media tab. Excellent. The second question, or the, I, and the thing is, is that for the first, for the first, the intention of, of this question is definitely, yeah, it's, it's not necessarily for academic purposes. It's more about family supports and services, right? Um, I would also check out maybe some of the associations if somebody's willing to let me know um, what geographic area they're in, there might be more specific resources or workshops that we could find for them. Or if there's somewhere where they don't have a lot of resources, then I would be looking for more online resources for them as well, things that they can access over um, online. For a second question, uh, I belong to a 2S society and I'm looking for other organizations and programs as contact points. So when I was first asked this question, I did definitely think about our research guide and then I was um, trying to figure out, um, usually when people are using colonial borders, I automatically think that the government will have some statistics because that's how they gather information. But then I went back into a research guide and said, I think that we should start with the associations tab, which was really helpful. Again, this was not necessarily an academic purpose. This was uh, somebody in their professional work looking for information and our research guide was the best place for them to start. Um, I'm looking for 2S perspectives on family wellness and child rearing. 
Yeah, this one was definitely, uh, this one was trickier for me because what I haven't shared is actually more specific details because it's more specific. Uh, but we definitely were looking at videos and films. We started to look at some theses. Uh, we actually started to figure out based off of, we started with resource lists and started to tease out some of the major um major scholars in this area of research and then started to look at their publications from there. So as you can see, uh, although we do try to gather all the information on a given topic, because our patron base is so broad, we do try to make sure that we have all of these into consideration when we're creating these because we don't necessarily know how folks are going to be using them. Okay, and lastly, this is the last little annotation that I'll get folks to do. Um, and the other, the other thing that uh, I'll do is if somebody is actually able to, so as long as everybody has checked out the chat and can see the link to the research guides, this will bring you to our research guides portal. So you can either just annotate on the visual that you have here, or you can feel free to just poke around some of the research guides from the link. Um, but one of the questions that I am very, very frequently asked is um, how people can ensure that their work is meaningful. Essentially, this is what they're asking. Uh, it usually will involve a bit more of a conversation between the two of us because uh, definitions around meaningful work are different or, or can mean different things for different people, right? Essentially, what I've found that people are asking in this question is that they want to make sure that their their work at UBC has local relevance. So with that in mind, with that question in mind, and I know that there are folks in this room that are coming from various educational backgrounds, um, if you could just put a little sticker next to some of the research guides that you would start with on how do you think that you would, where would you go looking to see how you would make meaningful research in your subject area? So I think I'll stop it from there. Um, yeah, there is no right answer, honestly. Uh, I feel that when people are looking for for that relevancy, it really does start with, with unpacking ourselves. So usually what I'll do is I'll start to ask folks questions about their area of research. We'll send them some of their, some of the guides that we do have here already listed, usually around a specific subject area. And I do see that there was somebody who put a blue arrow next to the Huihua Library Distance Research Guide. So this is where it can get a little bit trickier because this is actually where I would start to direct people um, and then use the other guides as, some, as supplements or supplementary resources. And the reason being, um, as we moved ourselves into a virtual space and an online environment, we had a lot of folks that were asking how to acknowledge the territories that they're on now that they are now that we're not all in the same space. And I know that CTLT has also uh, been speaking to this issue as well, or to this topic and this question. And with our distance research guide, we actually have, uh, we have tabs on territorial acknowledgements, but we also have information on how people can uh, figure out whose territory they're on, as well as things about uh, uh, positionality and how we can start to think about ourselves as related to research as well. So great job, everybody. Um, okay. And finally, I just wanted to say a big thank you to everybody who came to our session today. Um, just to reiterate, our research guides are created on patterns, trends, and questions. But for us, this shows us a gap in people's knowledge on a specific area. Um, our guides are meant to help people, right? We're, we're basically just seeing the patterns and questions, and we're trying to say, this seems like the major theme or topic that people are asking about. And I hope that I gave you a bit of transparency around how we, uh, about which, what information we choose to put forward and what information we actually choose not to highlight uh, just to be respectful of other ongoings outside of, outside of campus. So the way that we utilize our research guides are, are very specific to 
um, what our purposes are.